My name is Josh. I'm a solutions architect at Plumi, and this talk is called How to Win at Platform Engineering. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been doing tech for about 20 years now. Uh, previous positions I've held, I was a, an SRE at a company called Oscar Health. Uh, before that, I spent uh, about four years as a cloud consultant with a company called Second Watch, uh, doing a lot of consulting with different orgs, um, a lot of stuff around infrastructure as code, DevOps best practices, and kind of working with companies of different sizes all the way from like relatively small startups to like very large fortune small number of companies. Uh, before that I was a DevOps engineer at a local SaaS company called eMoney Advisor. Uh, and then before that I spent uh, about six years as a tech lead uh, at Weblink, uh, just a couple blocks around. And uh, I am a Philadelphia lifer. Um, so I'm gonna go real briefly into a def shared definition of platform engineering, just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, so platform engineering is kind of like an organizational pattern. Uh, very frequently what happens when, when larger orgs are adopting cloud, it kind of happens in a very piecemeal kind of ground up fashion. Uh, one team is interested in, you know, that we're like, hey, we want to run our first workload in the cloud. And so they choose the cloud of their choice. And then another team somewhere else in the org is like, okay, well, we want to run it on this other cloud. And so what you have is you have this kind of like hodgepodge of different application teams using different clouds, all doing things their same way. Uh, none of them particularly caring about day two concerns like observability or monitoring or governance or cost controls uh, or compliance or security, um, which are all, you know, I think we all in this room know are kind of important. Um, so what happens is these organizations will adopt a platform or a pattern called platform engineering. And so in platform engineering, you have a platform team that is responsible for the platform. Uh, and the platform is how applications get to production and are run there. And uh, inside the platform, we'll get, we'll get into the specific um, constituent parts of that in I believe the next slide, uh, but it's basically all the pieces that, again, that you need to get an application into production and start running it. And then another advantage of having a platform team is that it gives a single point in the org uh, for security and compliance to interface to make sure that the workloads that you're running are compliant. So um, you can basically break, break down a platform into two broad categories. Uh, that is the pre-production parts and the post-production. So the pre-production is going to be everything kind of from git push to however your application gets deployed. And then the post-production is going to be uh, all the things that, uh, that your application needs to run. And that includes uh, like infrastructure, your network, storage, compute. And then also the operability stuff, that, like monitoring. And then uh, we also have uh, controls and security and stuff like that in the post-production side. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going like, to set out what I think are some fairly, you know, it's, not everything is going to work exactly for every org, but these are, I think, pretty generally applicable steps uh, to establishing a, a functioning and beloved platform uh, in an organization. Um, so the first thing that you need is you need executive buy-in. Um, you, this, what you're, you're trying to impose order uh, and make application teams care about things that they are not incentivized to care about. And so, you know, in order, there's, there's, a, there's a carrot aspect to this and there's a stick aspect. And when you're trying to establish a platform team, uh, you really need the stick. And in order to have the stick, you have to have the executive buy-in. Um, so a great way to get the executive buy-in is that the platform team can be initiated ideally by someone who knows how to speak uh, really well to senior leadership uh, to get that buy-in because you're not only going to be potentially inconveniencing in the very small sense some of these application teams that are just trying to deliver their workloads um, and there's going to be resistance to that change uh, but then you're also asking for, for resources like you're presumably going to be pulling people from other parts of the org to establish this platform team. You're going to need budget for tooling uh, and you're going to need that headcount. So you need the executive buy-in first. Um, and then when you're getting this executive buy-in, you're going to want to try to establish, uh, you know, when you're pitching this, you're going to need to establish ideally measurable uh, outcomes that align with business goals. Uh, and like a great way, for example, to do that is to like uh, emphasize the Dora metrics. Uh, next, you need to staff the team, and there are a pretty wide range of skills uh, that a, a successful platform engineering team needs to have. Uh, and I did list these in what I feel are probably the order of importance. 
So first and foremost uh, is a customer focus. Uh, your application teams are your customers. Um, your security team is kind of sort of your customer as well. Uh, at the very least, you don't want to piss them off. So you need to have a good understanding of like their motivations, to have a good aptitude for empathy um, to their concerns. Uh, second, what you are doing, I mean, you're literally the, uh, you know, this is essentially a hub and spoke type of uh, arrangement and the platform's right there in the middle. Uh, so like this is fundamentally glue work. Uh, you should have people on the team who are good at glue work, who are good at getting people together, who are good at documenting and smoothing out processes uh, for efficiency and, and hopefully happiness. Uh, again, you need that you need that ability to manage up with leadership. You know, you could if the you know the platform team might have to impose something that would make a potential you know director of an application team unhappy, and so you need to be able to manage up uh, in that way. Of course, uh, pretty much every platform team is going to be dealing with some sort of cloud infrastructure, so you need to have uh, good knowledge of you know the ver whatever clouds you're working with, or if you're working in the data center, you know how. You know, VMware or whatever you're working with. You need to have that infrastructure expertise or at the very least, a very good aptitude to learn it. Uh, you don't necessarily have to come in being an operational expert, but you do need to be able to pick it up quickly. Uh, you also need concerns not just to establish the infrastructure, but also uh, to actually run applications and like what the concerns are, like how are we gonna debug things if something goes wrong? And again, you, know, you don't necessarily have to have in-depth experience with that, but you need to have the aptitude to do it. Uh, you need to have some idea of how budgets work uh, and how much uh, you know different architectures cost to run. Uh, and then finally, you know, platform teams are typically going to be developing some sort of tool. Uh, very often, this is going to be what's what is often referred to as an internal developer platform. Uh, and in order to do that effectively, you need to have a certain amount of uh, development expertise and like and skill in software design. Uh, you're at the very least you're probably going to be creating some sort of infrastructure as code modules that other teams are going to consume. So you need to know how to keep those uh, interfaces stable and also how to abstract the right thing. Because if you abstract too much, it's not going to be um, useful enough to enough parties. And if you abstract too little, you have a, you know, a giant mess that's not actually doing anything useful. Uh, so those, that software development expertise is also important. So step three, uh, this is something I've done successfully at a couple places where I work. Um, I love making team homepages whenever I join a team. And uh, these typically go in whatever your information management system is, so Confluence or Google Docs or whatever. Um, but I find it very, very helpful in general to write things down. Uh, and so what I like to do whenever I join a new team is like, if this doesn't already exist, hey, like, you know, what is our team's mission? Like, what... What outcomes are we trying to drive? What, what things are we trying to support? Uh, the list of systems that you actually are responsible for. Um, it will be very, very helpful for people that are searching that system to be able to find the team that's responsible if they need access or uh, if, if something's wrong with those systems. Uh, what kind of support are you providing on these systems? What are the SLOs? How do we get in touch if we need to, if there's an incident off hours? What hours are considered on hours? What types of levels of incidents, uh, you know, are appropriate for like what times? And then finally, like, who's actually on the team, and what are their what's their expertise? Uh, what are they, are they? Are um, if you a lot of platform teams will use what's called an envoy model. So I did this when I was at eMoney. Um, each member of the team uh, was responsible was the primary point of contact for three to five application development groups. And so it's good to know like, hey, who's your point of contact for, for if you're in this team, who's your point of contact on the platform team if you use that Envoy model? Uh, and it is absolutely critical to write it down, make it public, and then also socialize that. Uh, you know, if you have a team Slack channel, that should definitely be like in the, uh, the linked, you know, the top links, the links at the top of the channel, for example. Um, I actually had Claude, uh, which is, that's an AI model that's, that's run by Anthropic, generate this based off a of prompt. And this is, I think, pretty good. This is, this is damn near exactly uh, what I would have come up with. Um, so I'm not going to read it word for word, but you can kind of you know, scan it and get an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about this sort of defining the team's mandate and then making that public. Um, little side note that I'm a big fan in general of writing things down. I've always uh, said that documentation is kind of DevOps level zero uh, because you cannot 
you can't automate what you haven't actually documented. And uh, so writing things down in general as a practice, you, you should all probably be writing more. Okay, so uh, now it's time to start implementing some systems. And the best place to start, in my view, is the pre-production pipeline. You do not need any infrastructure as code knowledge to do this. Uh, this is exactly what I was responsible for at eMoney Advisor. We spun these up by hand on Windows machines. Um, you know, so this is the stuff that basically goes from Git push to uh, deploying, in, uh, deploying your application code. There's no infrastructure involved here. This is probably going to be like mutable deployments on virtual machines or something like that. Uh, but this is actually, if you can get this going, this is really good. <laughs> it's really, really good. So if, if, you know, if you never get further than this, you did good. Uh, but then you can introduce infrastructure as code. Um, and infrastructure as code is like tremendously powerful, particularly the tools that support working with multiple clouds or SaaS providers, because you can control all the circled stuff with infrastructure as code. Um, you know, you can define your, your pipelines uh, in infrastructure as code itself. I've done that myself. Uh, you can define your secrets management and the secrets that go in there. Um, of course, your compute network and storage. Uh, and your, your runtime platform. So, you know, if you're running Kubernetes clusters, those should definitely be controlled with, with IAC. So now that you have IAC, like, you know, that opens up quite a bit, and now you're, you're really, really cooking. Um, but now we can, you know, now once you're up comfortable using IAC, um, and it doesn't even have to be self-serve, by the way. Self-service is something that you should bring in very, very, very gradually, uh, in my view. Um, you definitely want to want to bring some controls in. Uh, this is like policies code would be the pre-production kind of left-hand side. So that's open policy agent or Pulumi policies or Terraform Sentinel or probably other things that I am not aware of. Uh, and then for the post-production, those are going to be detective controls. So the difference between these two is preventative controls are running before anything is actually provisioned. Um, it's kind of like, you know, policies code is very much like a linter. Um, you can typically run these tools, by the way, as advisory or mandatory. At the very least, if your organization is using IAC extensively, uh, and most of you probably are, you should be using some sort of like policy and just turn it on as advisory, just so you know uh, that, that you are potentially doing things that are insecure or uh, expensive. Uh, and then the detective controls, they're going to be running in your environment, typically your cloud environment. Uh, in AWS, that's like AWS config rules, uh, and they will detect non-compliant infrastructure. The advantage being the preventative controls, you know, that they pretty much only work on IAC, but detective controls will catch everything. So if you have extensive uh, click ops in your operation, in your organization, you're going to need those detective controls as well to catch everything. Okay, so uh, that, uh, those are all the steps to get your platform up and running. And uh, with the remaining time, I'd like to go through a few scenarios uh, this is like pseudo interactive. Um, I'm going to ask you to uh, um, to think about these uh, in your heart. <laughs> Whatever that. Uh, does anybody remember that? Uh, please scream inside your heart thing from a. It was a Japanese roller coaster. Anyway, I digress. Um, problem number one. So your platform is unloved. It's not getting the adoption that you would hope. Um, there are two ways that you can see this happening. The first is that your teams are circumventing the platform entirely. Uh, maybe they're deploying things via click ops. Maybe, uh, I don't know, they could be doing anything, but they're not going through the platform. Uh, and then the second is that teams might be using the platform, but they're using the wrong tool for the job at hand. So for example, they might actually need a document database, but instead they're using a relational database. All right, so think about that for a few seconds. What? would your response to this problem be? All right, let's go. Uh, so I think the key here is, uh, in this scenario, is a lack of customer focus. Um, so this is how I would approach it. Um, first, I would try and use some detective controls to find uh, non-compliant workloads. Um, are people using services in, like, managed services they shouldn't be using? Are they using AMIs that are out of date and insecure? Um, are they missing tags, things like that? So use those detective controls. Uh, to find things that are non-compliant. Uh, and then you need to, you know, it's, it's said in every DevOps days I've ever attended ever, you know, we're really dealing with people problems more than technical problems. So go out there and establish, uh, ideally, if your organization is scaled for it, one-on-one -on -one relationships with people on those teams. You know, go talk to people because when you are interacting with folks face-to-face, -face, um, it's going to get a lot of the organizational dysfunction will just flat out dissolve. Um, 
If you are in a larger scale organization uh, using satisfaction surveys to solicit feedback, that is kind of the, as far as I understand, that's like the, the best like research backed way to prove that your platform is good, uh, is, is satisfaction surveys on developer experience. And then uh, finally, you know, uh, if if you think that it would, if you think it would go well, uh, you can allow outside contributions to your platform, and you need so you would want to have like a sort of uh, the equivalent of like a contributing.md file uh, for your platform. So it's like, how can people contribute their own additions to the platform? Um, okay, scenario two: uh, you your IAC modules are a mess. Um, they are either not stable. Uh, so you are pissing off your app teams, uh, or they're not upgrading, and then you, uh, you know, are creating a larger and larger headache when people eventually do need to upgrade, uh, or you're just spending an inordinate amount of time maintaining modules uh, without much benefit. So, um, try doing less. Um, story time. I uh, I work for Plumi. I wrote the latest version of our publicly available VPC module. I screwed it up. Um, it's writing IAC modules, the, and especially the more components they have, um, it's, it's really hard. It's a very, very hard problem. It is a very, very hard problem. I've, I've gone through this half a dozen times in my career. It's just hard. Um, it's hard to abstract infrastructure it's, it, you know, because you have these kind of competing goals where it's like, okay, we need to try and abstract as much as possible, but then still leave these things usable to as wide an audience as possible. If you look at the Terraform VPC module, the publicly available one on the registry, it's got what, like I think 150 inputs and like 250 outputs. Like that is a maintenance nightmare. No, by the way, no platform team, unless you are like huge, 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 should take on something like that. Cause that is, that's bananas. Um, so yeah, so write as few as possible, delay them as long as possible, delay 1.0 as long as possible, um, keep things in an experimental namespace so that it is very, very clear that these things are experimental and not stable. Um, one of the things that I think is, is good advice is to try and do like kind of, so we have this concept of like level one constructs or level zero constructs would be like a raw resource like an AWS VPC. Um, and then try to maybe aim for like a, a level one and a half construct. So like an example for that is um, uh, the EKS, uh, for those of you that are familiar, so EKS is AWS's managed uh, Kubernetes service. Um, there is a way to connect a Kubernetes service account, which is a Kubernetes object, to an AWS IAM account, which would allow that account to do stuff in AWS, like provision a database. Um, and that technology is called URSA. And then writing the policies for that is like really, really painful, but it also follows like a very, very clear pattern. And so like that's like, you know, a very, very small thing you can abstract that saves a ton of time. Um, so that's what I mean when I say like 1.5 constructs. Uh, and then you also need to have a very clearly articulated uh, support policy. So, uh, you know, we are going to support things for this long uh, after, you know, the next version comes out. Uh, you need to ideally use policy to leverage policy to make sure that people are upgrading what they need to upgrade. And that should be a warning first, right? So give people plenty of advance notice. Like, hey, you're out of compliance. You need to upgrade this. And then you turn it on to be an error that would actually stop their deployments and force them to upgrade. Uh, and so, and you also need to document what the upgrade path is. All right, next scenario. Uh, hot potato production incidents. Uh, so the, 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 the term hot potato here means like, hey, like I thought it was your problem, I thought it was your problem. So no one's actively taking responsibility. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this might be. Um, uh, if we are assuming good faith, it's often because they act legitimately thought the other party was responsible for this thing. Um, so what would the response be here? Okay, a um, couple of things. So while the incident is being debugged, you need to have a shared communication channel. Slack channel or similar um, is a really great way to do this. Um, I have been in a lot of production incidents where things have happened out of band. Someone hops on the phone. Uh, you need to recall, you need to record the general, you know, hey, I talked to so-and-so on the phone and they said, you know, change the BGP settings to blah, blah, blah. Um, you need to log that stuff that, that happens out of band also in the channel. Same thing with like if you're performing actions in the console uh, because those would not necessarily make it into the shared channel. You might want to provide links to any builds that you started if you're trying to resolve this through IAC. Uh, so that's what you need to do while the thing is actually happening. 
And then afterwards, uh, you know, everybody kind of needs to sit at a table and hash it out, uh, to figure out how we can make this not happen next time. So, you know, you need to make sure that who's responsible for what is clearly written down and also that you have a, uh, you know, a verbal or written, you know, acknowledgement like, hey, we're on the same page for this. Um, if you have uh, any drift, so if someone has gone in and changed something in the console that is managed by infrastructure as code, you need to resolve that drift afterwards uh, and make sure that those changes make it back into the code or are reverted in the console if they're no longer needed. Um, but, the, and, but in my experience, the reality is um, drift is always a conversation in general that needs to be had, not something that should be automatically remediated. Um, you can alert on it and warn on it, but if you resolve drift automatically, you stand a, uh, a very good chance of, of undoing a very intentional change that is there for a good reason. Uh, and then of course, you're gonna wanna also uh, revise any playbooks uh, to try and try and smooth out the process. This is fairly basic, you know, um, blameless post-mortem type, type stuff. All right, uh, I think this is the last one. So um, your issue is that your platform is a 1996 I-95 tire fire. Um, that actually happened, by the way. Uh, this is like a little bit of, of Philadelphia lore. Uh, it was really bad uh, and I-95 was shut down and it was, uh, you know, a just a, a tr just chef's kiss Philadelphia moment. Uh, there was a giant tire fire in uh, Port Richmond. Okay, so um, this, when I've seen this in the field, it's been by, um, frankly, by platform teams that thought their capabilities were greater than what they actually were. Um, these are all real things that I saw. Um, I, yeah, I worked at a place that had their own custom fork of Apache Mesos because they thought they would give them competitive advantage. Uh, mind you that this was a health insurance company. Uh, so I'm not really sure how that all kind of maths up, um, that same company uh, made a bespoke distributed unit test runner. Uh, that got that engineer a speaking slot at HashiConf, and then they promptly left for a fang. And then guess who was stuck using it for all time? As far as I know, they're still using it today. Uh, same thing, we implemented Atlantis uh, using bash scripts and manual TF apply. So basically every time somebody needed some infrastructure to actually be deployed off hours, I got paged. Uh, and that was kind of the point where I said, I don't ever want to carry a pager again, and then I uh, got a job at Pulumi. Um, I don't know whether this is like science necessarily, but I've noticed a high correlation of really, really bad platform stuff uh, tends to correlate with really stupid project code names uh, that uh, typically tie back to either like a Pokemon or a Marvel thing. Uh, I'm not sure why that is, but some things I just know. Um, all right, so what are we gonna do? Well, um, I'm sorry, I don't really have a happy ending for this one. Um, these are all incredibly expensive mistakes that are incredibly difficult to undo. Um, but I love this Turkish proverb that no matter how far you go down the, long, the wrong road, turn back, uh, because your team is just going to be paying, your door metrics are going to forever. And if you ever wanna get that productivity back, you're just gonna have to fix the mistake eventually. Um, you can be strategic with this. Um, I certainly wouldn't do it for everything. You know, you're going to want to try to identify the best ROI. Uh, you're going to want to try to put in small uh, intermediate fixes when you can. Um, but like the, you're, you've lost your way. Um, there's this one, there's this great blog post, by the way, by Charity Majors. I suggest everybody, everybody read it. It's called Know Your One Job and Do It First. Um, it is not specifically about platform teams. It's actually about like what you should be doing, what you should be focusing on and prioritizing in the workplace uh, in order to get promoted. Uh, but like it's, it's really excellent and it kind of like applies to a lot of um, things both, both in your individual job, in group stuff and even in your personal life. So uh, do check that out. Um, there are some caveats to this. If you really, really, really know what you're doing, um, then you know, okay, then you can do these kind of esoteric, you know, kind of wild things, um, or unless you're like really big tech, but like if you try and, if you try and take like FANG principles and apply them to like a 500 person company, you're, you're definitely on the wrong path. Um, yeah. So, um, wow, misspelled something on the last uh, slide, but this is your North Start, if you will, your North Star. Uh, as long as you do this, you kind of can't go wrong. And that is um, you as a platform team should focus on delivering software quickly with better reliability to more markets. And with that, thank you very much for your time.
We have time for questions. Hmm? We have time for questions. Oh, we still have time for questions. All right. Would anybody like to ask me a question? Thank you. Two-part question. Um, what do you do to onboard application teams? And second, what has been your experience with community of practice, if any? Uh, community of practice? Yes. Is that like Cloud Center of Excellence, or? You, can, you could look at it that way, but group of people that are interested in the same topic. Oh, like, like, like a guild model, correct. like the Spotify guilds? Yeah, so that's, like that's another way to do it. Um, a lot of enterprises do start with like a CCOE, where they basically just pluck the 10 or 15 people uh, from like around the org who have like any cloud experience whatsoever. Um, as a consultant, like, you know, it's usually like that plus a consultancy to help get them onboarded. And that's really just, that's really just the, the sort of germination of the platform team because it's, that's almost always what that evolves into. Um, it is, those, those types of practices are definitely good if you don't yet, like the guild model um, as a way to share practices. It's great, but eventually it doesn't scale. And I, I find the tip for, at least for organizations of a certain size, they will always need to move to a platform team. At what point does an organization have enough applications to shift from like a more traditional DevOps model to like a platform engineering model? How many pet projects have to mature to make it worth trying to rebuild that team structure in a different way? All right, so there's weighing factors on this. Let me go back to the org chart diagram. Okay, right, multiple clouds plat is pushing you in the platform direction. Enough workloads, um, enough different uh, pl uh, compute platforms that you're running on. Um, you know, you may not necessarily want to run anything on VMs. You want, might want to push toward containerization. Uh, if, you know, cost is getting out of control, uh, that will definitely push you that way. I don't think there's any hard number. I mean, I'm going to, you know, five, five application teams, each with at least one workload that they run could be enough. I mean, you know, it, I, I have to get the consultant answer. It really depends. But again, there's like weighing factors, right? Um, the heavier your security and compliance needs, like that is going to have to, that's going to, probably nothing will push you faster than like security and compliance or like massive cost overruns um, because they are just so potentially damaging uh, to the org. You know, like HIPAA violations are what, like a million a piece or something like that? Yeah, it's real bad. It's real bad. So um, that will that will definitely push you towards some sort of centralization of control. Any other questions? Oh, we have one more, if we have time. Hopefully we do, because I'm already talking. But um, ah. <laughs> thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more upon uh, policy as code strategies that you were talking about, and if you have any specific examples of that. Sure. So um, there again. So the t for tooling, the names that I'm most familiar with. I, I mean, I'm a Pulumi employee, so like we have a policy as code uh, open source product that I really love. Uh, Terraform has Sentinel. I'm sure there's other things in the sort of surrounding ecosystem that probably did the same thing. And then there's also Open Policy Agent. And so what these tools do is they essentially are going to look at your infrastructure as code. Um, and, and you're going to examine the properties of this thing. So let's say you're looking at an AWS EC2 security group. Uh, and if that security group allows, say, SSH from any IP address, um, you're going to, it's going to flag that as non-compliant. And then typically you're going to be able to set these things as either a warning. So it's going to, you know, basically be like, hey, uh, you shouldn't be doing this. Or sometimes it'll be an error. So it'll actually like halt the uh, IEC operation. Those are the those are the preventative controls. The detective controls are going to run in your cloud. So in AWS, uh, it's going to be an AWS config rule, and uh, it's going to you're going to say like, oh, like all S3 buckets have to have tags and can't be public read. And then you can typically with these tools specify a remediation action as well. Um, so that could be anywhere from alerting in Slack to actually killing the infrastructure um, if it's if it's that egregious. Does that answer your question? Cool. All right. Well, hi, thanks for your talk. I was wondering, how would you practice cloud or platform engineering skills? Like platforms like lead code and hack rank let people practice, you know, core data structures and algorithms. What would those core concepts be for, you know, platform engineering? I think that platform engineering, all right, so first off, even, even when I was an application uh, developer, I never 
ever had to use algorithms at all. What, what actually mattered was the number of like network hops. So like if I was doing like a really inefficient SQL query, like that was bad. Um, but algorithms never actually came into it. I think what it comes down to more, I, first off, I think the platform engineering skills are at least 50% people skills. So, uh, you know, people that may go on later to, uh, to do like consulting or like sales engineers, like I think that's a very common uh, sort of group of job titles that, that people will have throughout their careers. But as far as the software design skills, um, it's really about like constructing modules or making like clean interfaces. Um, like, you know, platform, in, platform teams might have like CLI tools, uh, things like that, but it's not, it's very much not like hard, what I would call hard computer science, leak code type things. Um, it's, it's much more subjective and much more about uh, people and, and business processes and, in, uh, and also like a sense of good design. So I guess that also brings me to the point of how would you practice it outside of, you know, being a part of a corporation, is there a way to, I guess, simulate that? It's hard. It's really hard. Like, I, I have no idea how people become, like, like traditional operations folks, like SREs. Like, because there's no way to practice it. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to spin up, like, a, you know, a federated Kubernetes cluster in your, in your home lab. I mean, you could do this, but it's quite expensive, and it's still never going to get the real simulation. Um, but I think what you can do is you can read about it for sure, right? You can, you can try to gather as much information from the field as possible. Um, you can certainly write IAC programs yourself and like, you know, ha get feedback from people who are, um, who are pros about it. You can read, for example, the user guides. If you're in AWS, the AWS user guides are really, really good and they'll explain to you how these services actually work under the covers. Um, all of those things are important, but it's, it, is, it is very, very, very difficult. There is no leak code for, for platform engineering as far as, as far as I'm concerned.